look at myself up in the monitor there and I see I'm flashing. Um, the, this is really the corollary of the capitalization of earnings and the cash flow approaches, the dual capitalization. Its advantages are this, that it, its major advantage is that it, provide, it recognizes that the risk attaching to intangible assets is higher than the risk which attaches to, to tangible assets. Basically, if you have a, if you have a, um, a, a building and you buy a company that has that building in it, let's say that's what you've done, that is less of a chance you're taking than if you're buying an, a company that has absolutely nothing in it except one very smart guy or two very smart people. Basically, that you're buying the goodwill or a name that everybody will go back to. So that's what this tries to recognize is the difference between those two things. And the other thing is that does it provides a check on other methods. Um, the disadvantage is, once again, you've got to have two capitalization rates, as I'll illustrate in a minute. And your judgment on determining what those are might be a difficult one. Basically what you do, and I think it may not be make sense necessary to go through the VAL 27. So let's miss that one, those of you who are awake, and we'll go to VAL 28. Um, looking uh, at P trading, and this is on, set out in Appendix 9 on page 102, we're back to the same tangible asset but backing. You'll recall that amount is the 392,464. And remember, we're looking at the whole company at the moment to see what it's worth. We're not looking to see necessarily what the common shares are worth. We've got to carve out $90,000 if we're going to do that. We take out the redundant assets at this point. We're not disposing of those redundant assets. We're just taking them out, looking at the tangible asset backing. So we're not discounting those for the taxes or commissions or any of those things. We know that the tangible earning asset backing, the tangible assets that are earning income for us, but we're not disposing of them, so there's no discount for taxes, is 324,464. We think from those assets, we'd like to get at least 12%, because that's tangible assets. We can get 10% by putting our money in the bank. 12% would be nice on those tangible assets. So I've taken a 12 at, at, at 12% on those tangible assets. That would give 38,000. We know that the representative earnings of this company are 40,000. So we have a slight amount that we call super profits. Those super profits excess earnings on those assets relate to something else, but we know that they're super profits. And we're just going to capitalize those super profits at our high rate, at our five and a half times multiple, at our 19.5% or 19.4%. Okay? We just, it's just those super profits, because that, that's the goodwill, really, that earns those super profits. We know we've got tangible assets that earn the rest at about 12%. So. We capitalize that small excess, and that's a $5,500. Once again, it's a, it's a principle rather than actual amount. We add back the tangible earning asset backing, the redundant assets, the net redundant assets now, and the fair market value of S company, the company just acquired, and we come to a figure of 491000 And then I've computed a composite rate there, which isn't really meaningful because that will vary depending upon the components, depending on what the excess profits are. But it is a value. Um, the value range using the single capitalization, if you're all following me on VAL 28, that should be 400,000 down to 340,000. It shouldn't be 310,000, it's 340,000. That's the range. Here's another basis that says, hey, maybe we're at the top end of the range. That's more appropriate to be at the top end of the range. We may even go higher than a, than a six times multiple because we have the good tangible asset backing and we know that on tangible assets we'd be happy to take only 12 percent rather than 19 percent. It's another check. All the figures that we've gone through 
in making allowance for my, uh, my funny assumptions, would indicate that the earnings of this company could be higher than they are at the moment, which would also indicate that we can pay more than the 400,000. You will recall the capitalization of cash flow produced a value of 442. The one we had a lot of discussion, the discounted cash flow, which is really looking, projecting future, indicates a value of 647, quite a high value. The 442 was the capitalization of cash flow. We're adding back uh, depreciation and things like that that we don't need. Those, that amortization of goodwill that is not a cash flow consideration. Um, and on this basis, we come to 491. The 647 looked a bit out of line, um, but it seems to me that we can go to a higher value. Okay? Those are basically the methods of, of valuing corporations. The question then is, if we're looking at the Income Tax Act, what, who, if, if we're an open and unrestricted market and it's a knowledgeable buyer, somebody having full knowledge of the facts who's not under any compunction to buy, and we have a knowledgeable vendor who's not in, under any compunction to sell, there's no reason for him to sell that particular company. They're both knowledgeable, there's no restrictions on whom he can transfer his shares to. Who, I mean, it's open and unrestricted. Would we look around then for a special purchaser? And what is a special purchaser? Special purchaser, and generally speaking, when companies are taken over, they are purchased by special purchasers. It's somebody who realizes the economic advantages or the net incremental value benefits through the purchase of, um, of uh, the company in question. Um, Theoretically, then, if we're going back to my, my original definition, the open and unrestricted market, all special purchases should be considered. Anybody in the world who might pay, pay $1 more than you would for this company. And if you've got a couple of special purchases, theoretically, they could bid that company up by dollar, dollar by dollar till it got almost out of sight until they came to their real value. Is that what is meant by the fair market value in the income tax sense, if you want to make a sale to your son and you've got to determine what the fair market value of a company is, should you be running around looking to see what the, whether there's a special purchaser around who could possibly be buying that company? Um, what are we looking at now? Are we really looking at the value of the company or the price that somebody would pay? Um, it's the price that is obtainable. And I have a problem with this concept of the special purchaser, except when I'm looking to get a high V-Day value and find somebody who might say, oh yeah, I would have paid that because the business would work perfectly with mine. Looking now in a non-arms length transaction, I think you have a little bit of a concern as to whether you should go around looking for a special purchaser, somebody who will pay the 647000 because he knows he can make that business go. And in a non-arm's length transaction, I can tell you what you would normally do is say, look at the maintainable earnings. My son isn't smart enough to make the business go. If anybody comes and looks at it in retrospect, this is a reasonable basis. And normally you would go on, on the basis of the maintainable earnings. I just um, want to talk about special purchases because it is a concept uh, People who write on valuations, Ian Campbell being an example, always talk about special purchases, and he hasn't made up his mind whether that special purchaser is part of the open and unrestricted market. Maybe if we look at that part, is he a restricted market? Is that a restricted market for your shares? And if you say, yep, that special purchase is just in a very, very restricted market, I can take him into consideration in determining what is the fair market value of my shares, then you have some comfort in the lower value. Um, those of you who work in the divorce area, I don't think you can go around and find a special purchaser and say, this is the value that I'm going to rip the guy off at, if that's what the example is. I talked a little bit earlier about um, control for valuation purposes. 
what is this control? Is it what Lou suggested? Is it the de jure control, the numeric control, the control that has the right to appoint the, the majority of directors? Or is it, in fact, that you control the company? You control the company because you have somehow other voting control through a voting trust agreement? Or is it uh, um, the fact that you have 30% and nobody comes close? And therefore, you can control the company. Revenue Canada, if we go to them, looking at what they like, what they like to see in, in control, what they think is control, they'll say, we'll only give you a control premium at B-Day especially if there is a family or a group which controls numerically, that has de jure control, the power to appoint the majority of directors. Having decided on that, what should a control premium be? If you agree that there should be a control premium, how much should it be? Um, historically, these have been in the ranges of, you come to your value, your rateable value, if you like, remember that earlier calculation. Historically, these have been in the 20 to 30% range. Um, they belong to the controlling shareholder. That's what the premium is now. How would, you, how would you apply that premium? I'll look at that in a minute. It, the reason that people have argued that there's a basis for, for control for a premium is that the controlling shareholder can, in fact, declare the dividends, not a factor if you have a shareholder's agreement. Can it direct the affairs of the company? Because he can appoint himself as the, as he can appoint the board of directors principally. He can dictate the liquidity of an investment, sell off a sub if that's what he wants to do. Or he can say, I'm uh, worthy of a large bonus this year and pay it to himself. Whether we go at 20% or 30% will depend on the size of the interest being acquired. If you look at VAL 32, that particular example, um, Let's say we have a company that has a value of two million five. I just have these two more to do, and I think we should finish them before coffee. Um, we have a value of two million five. Um, the rateable value per share would then, we're in this particular example, is twenty five dollars. Um, let's say we've chosen arbitrarily, we've chosen a control premium of thirty percent. And my control block is 72% of the company, 72,000 shares. What does a control premium apply to? Should it be the total value of the company, like 2 million five? Should that be the control premium? So you'd say the control premium is $750,000. Is that the appropriate amount? Because if so, that gives the value of the 72% interest at $2,550,000 which you'll recognize is more than the total value of the company. Notwithstanding that, I've seen the people do that. Say that, that the control premium should apply to the total value of the company. Whether 30% is right or wrong, it doesn't matter. That's theoretically what can happen. If the control premium is that high, then the value of company is, the value of the control block is worth more than the value of the company. Not a very logical result. The other alternative is to say that the control premium applies to the percentage owned, 30% of the 2,005,000. Um, that would give 540,000 and would imply that the 72% value is worth 2,340. More logical result, but just still, just about the full value of the company. So if, if you accept the reasons why you have a control premium, that you can control the company, that you can point the majority of the board of directors, all of those things, then logically that control premium should apply only to the first 51%. And the rest of it, why is there a control premium applied to it? Because you could sell off those shares, and the person who buys them is in no better position than the guy who presently owns 49% or 28% or whatever it is. So I would think that that is the most logical amount. My question at the bottom is, why should there be any control premium and the answer is basically the reasons why there should be no minority discount. And that's set out on VAL 33. Um, 
you might argue for a minority discount under certain circumstances if you're only buying a minority. You might argue for a minority discount if you're inheriting shares, shares in a private company and all those things. You might argue for them, but I don't know if there's any good, good reason. We've had biases in the past to ask for a minority discount, um, to, uh, to argue for a low value where we had estate taxes and succession duties. We don't have any succession duties in Ontario anymore, um, not for eight years or so. So we don't need that bias anymore to argue for low values. We then argued that there should be no minority discount or the, that the value of the sh minority shares should be high at V-Day because we wanted to get as high a cost as we could to save ourselves from future taxes. Having got all those nice arguments, we now find they're being used against them, against us as we argue for low values again in non-arms length transactions or deemed dispositions when somebody dies. I think you're all aware of that concept. When you die and don't transfer your shares to spouses and so on, you've got a deemed disposition at the fair market value of those assets. And now all of a sudden we're trying to use arguments that argue for a lower value and the department's throwing back the same arguments that we used for V-Day high values. I think there are other things to consider now as to whether the uh, minority discount is really appropriate. There's a lot of legal protection, I don't need to tell you that, given to minority shareholders. The securities laws protect them, Canada Business Corporations Act, Ontario Business Corporations Act, amongst the other provincial statutes. They all tend to protect the minority shareholder as much as they can, especially in a private corporation. The size of a holding, I think, is relevant. You know, if I can request that a company be wound up or that I can get a reasonable value for my shares, if somebody's got to pay me $10 instead of $1 he wants to give me, he'll pay me the $10 to get rid of me. However, if it turns out to be a million dollars rather than 100000 he'll think twice. I think because I have a larger value, a larger holding, there shouldn't be a minority discount where I can have some say in, 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 in what the minor, majority shareholder does. Shareholders' agreements, shareholder relationships, and of course the existence of any kind of a market at all, they'll all determine whether I have a value to my shares. The shareholders' agreement might say that I can go and sell my shares to somebody else, but I have to offer, offer them to the majority shareholder first. If you can find somebody who will buy much, you know, pay much more, there's an external market that determines what the value of your shares are. If your shareholders agreement that says you have to sell at net book value, then you've got a restricted market. The tax department says you've got to ignore that shareholders agreement in determining what the value is. However, that may not be a big, big problem. I um, think that, that it's three o'clock now and Peter, if it's all right with you, uh, I think we should stop for coffee. Afterwards, I'd like to answer any questions on valuation issues, but I want to talk about, immediately afterwards, about increasing or decreasing the potential taxes on cer certain uh, transactions. And they can be arm's length, non-arm length transactions. Everybody wants to minimize those taxes. So we'll come back, we'll talk about that. Meanwhile, try and find a bulb for this. What time? 3.30? 3.15? The microphone on. Maybe we can get back at this. I had a couple of questions during the coffee break just uh, because I went too quickly through this. I think it really is something that I hope you will use. I've used it myself because I've had to a few times um, since I first did it. And I think it's useful. I think it's a, it, at least it focuses your attention on, on some of the factors. I had a few questions. How would you choose, once again, how do you choose a multiple, the right kind of multiple? I mean, why five and a quarter? Why four? Why um, six? Why any of those things? And I think that the factor that you choose is purely a function of what you expect to get from a company. As I said, if you can get 12% without putting your money into a corporation, why don't you just put it in the bank and get 12%? I mean, it's the same thing with buildings. They want people to build apartments, but all you can get is 6% on your money. You're not going to do it. 
there's not enough money in it. Same with a business, at least you have a choice with a business. If you're going to get only 12.5% on your money from a business, then eight times multiple is what you would use. If you want to get 12.5% and that's all you want to get, you might say, okay, 12 into 100, that's eight. So I'll use an eight times multiple. But most people don't want that. They want a whole lot more because they've got a whole lot more at risk. Okay. Anybody have any questions on the valuation? Um, the, I have an interest rate there, I think, in the dual capitalization that is really a bastard interest rate. It's the 12% that I said I'm happy to get on my tangible assets, assets that I can feel and look at, but I wanted more on the earnings that could reasonably be attributed to goodwill. And I wanted 19 or 20% on, on that because there wasn't the tangible asset backing. And that's what my dual capitalization did. Maybe we can, Lou, would you like to turn down some of the lights so that people can see this? You turned off my light too, do you want to turn it back on? I don't believe this. <laughs> I've discovered where the spare bulb is. I've discovered where the switch is. I won't do that. I was going to tell you how you qualify to be a finance minister. Obviously, I can't do that. Um, you, most of you will recognize that I do speak with a foreign accent, and it changes. Um, I was born in Africa. Um, I went to school in Scotland, and um, I went to Cambridge University. All not very relevant to what I do now. But um, I used to tell, <laughs> tell different kinds of stories about all those places, and people got upset. The only people who don't get upset are the Scots. So I'm going to tell you a true Scottish story. And um, this doesn't have any, any, um, any relevance to what I'm talking about. Um, this is a story about Jock and Jesse who um, were expecting their first baby. And they lived in the highlands of Scotland. They were um, fairly, oh good. You've done it. That came on again. This story does have relevance, you'll see in a minute. <laughs> Great. We'll take a chance on just that. Um, anyway, so they were expecting their first baby, and, and because they lived in this little hovel in Scotland, um, they couldn't afford to take Jessie into the hospital, so instead they had the doctor come out to Jessie. And as her time came due, um, Jock was panicking a little bit, and to give him something to do, the doctor said, here, hold this lantern. So he had a lantern. You'll see the relevance of the story now. A little bit of light here. Hanging over his finger, and the doctor said, okay, he says, uh, Jock, lady, he says, uh, bring the lantern over a wee bit closer. And so Jock takes the lantern over, and the doctor pulls out this baby. He says, congratulations, you got a broad wee boy. He says, hold the baron and rock him. So Jock's rocking the baby, and he's got the lantern on his finger still, and he's rocking away like this. Then the doctor says, Jock lady, he says, bring the lantern over again. He says, there's another one coming. So he takes it over, and sure enough, it's another little baby, another broad little, little boy, and he gives it to him, and he's rocking away. A few minutes later, the doctor says, Jock lady, he says, bring the lantern over again. So he takes the lantern over again. Another baby says, congratulations, triplets, three broad wee boys. He says, hold this parent too, and rock him. So he's rocking away. And the doctor says, Jock lady, he says, uh, bring the lantern over one more time. And Jock says, not bloody likely. He says, I figure it's the light that's attracting them. <laughs> so now we have light. And um, just to waste a little bit more time, maybe I'll do this too. I was going to tell you how, how you get to be a finance minister. And I don't know if you can read that. Maybe I'll move it down a bit. This basically 
those of you who can read it, um, is a nine times table. You can see this left one. This is nine times table. And the second one is another question. This is a question for finance ministers. Anybody been through this? Let's see if you can be the finance minister of Canada. It doesn't matter what party you belong to. They give the same test to everybody. But I gather that it went like this when McCachan did it, because he's my unfavored finance minister. That what happened, I have to come this time because I'm not. Still a microphone on? Um, he looked at this, and the, there were two questions. It was, um, he had, and he didn't have very much time to do them in, it was a five hour exam. The first question was <laughs> complete the following table. I haven't written that in. And the second one was convert this square into four equilateral triangles using two transversals. So he starts off and he says, um, is one times anything is just that and nothing more. So he writes down nine. Two times nine, that is easy. Damn, run out of fingers. Well, I'll have to go on to the next one. Geez, they get difficult in a hurry, don't they? Here's one. The only difference between that and that is the zero. It's either zero, nine, or nine, zero. Nine, zero. It's a head. It's nine, zero. It's a head. Nine, zero. <laughs> Quadrangle, square, triangle, equilateral, transversal. Don't know what any of those words mean. Well, let's have a look and see. How am I doing here? Got that one right, that one right. How many haven't I got yet? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Um, he's two right, eight wrong. I must have miscounted. I can't be that bad. One, two, three, <laughs> four, five, six, seven, eight. Two right, eight wrong. Oh, shit, I'll never pass. May as well sign my name and go home. <laughs> That's how they do it. Anyway, really glad the lights came on just for that. OK, if we have, if I've confused you on, on valuations, I hope it'll be less confusing as I get into talking about tax. I think I'll put these overheads on, because those of you who fall asleep will wake up and find and know precisely where I am. And then you can probably tell me. OK. First of all, the, you've all got these. These were the ones that were handed out at lunchtime. And um, once again, there are a few intentional errors in them. And, I'll, and I think it's easiest. This is much more comprehensive than my words. I should give Howard Kello credit for the words, which is the tax words. He, um, he originally did that when we were out in Vancouver. And he was under a bit of a time pressure, because when we did it in, in 81, we just had a new budget, and everything was changing. And it took me a long time to change it back without adding new, much new stuff. So I hope that the new stuff will come clear to you as we go through this, um, this tax. Um, I, don't, I don't like to think, and I never used to think, that you should do everything for tax purposes. But when we're talking about money and you're giving away 25% of whatever you get, then it does become a big, big factor. And in lots of situations, valuations, especially with private companies, taxes are very, very relevant. There was a symposium this last summer on the simplification of the taxation of small business corporations. And there were guys there who identified problems that I didn't even knew existed, and then solutions to them with taxation of small business for something that is, should be simple it is the most complicated aspect of the Income Tax Act. What I intend to do today is go through some of the possibilities, some of the things that you might consider using in the sale of a business, why tax is such an important part of it, and try and clarify, once again, just with principles, clarify some of the anomalies that can arise and why you've got to look at, at tax, tax in the corporation and tax outside. Now, this overhead is uh, tax one. If you can't see it, what it says is that there are rollovers are av available. Rollover is basically things you can do without resulting in tax. General principle, even in a barter transaction, that that transaction takes pl place at fair market value, my old concept of fair market value. So these are some rollovers that are available. And what I want to do 
using P trading as an example, is try and identify those that you might think of, those that we can use, either in combination or in isolation. Okay? The first and most important rollover, and I'm sure most of you are familiar with it, is where is the Section 85 rollover. This is um, where shares of one corporation, actually it can be assets, it doesn't have to be shares, are being exchanged for those of another. So typically in our case, we might consider whether P trading should be transferred to a holding corporation, what the advantages of doing that might be. So that's a share for share exchange, but it's one that we can do without, without involving in any, ourselves in any tax. A and B can transfer their shares to a holding company, and the holding company can say, okay, I'll take on your cost base. In A's case, it's 37,000. In B's case, it's 90,000. I'll take on of those as the cost of the P trading co-shares. And A and B say, okay, for that, I'll just assume that my cost of your shares holding company, in A's case, it'll be 37,000, and in B's, it'll be 90,000. I'll come back to that. That's one kind of a rollover. There is another kind of a rollover, which is a rollover really for the vendor. And that's the one provided for an 85.1. It's the same, except that an arm's length corporation can acquire the shares. And what happens is that I can be the vendor of my shares and I say, if you're giving me shares back, I don't want to be triggering a gain because I don't know whether I'm going to get that money. So I want to have the adjusted cost base of the shares you're giving me the same as the shares I'm giving up and just take money into income or take the capital gain in as I actually realize it. The purchaser might say, well, that's fine for you. It doesn't, doesn't affect me. You can do that. I'm not going to get in an 85 rollover situation with you, but I'm going to use my right to elect to take um, 85, to take the shares at the actual cost, the cost that I paid for them, because I might sell those shares before I've paid you out, and I want to have the higher cost. And that is possible. I haven't got all of the... Um, there are certain terms and conditions. It has to be arm's length, and there has to be less than 10%, and a few other things. They're not all down here, but that is available. And you should look at that when, a, when one of your clients is selling to a corporate purchaser and getting back something other than cash. The third one is really a conversion, where you have convertible PREP shares or convertible shares. They're convertible into another class of shares, or you've got debt that is convertible into shares there can be a rollover for that as well. So you might have $50,000 worth of debt. It's converted into shares that have a $60,000 value. If that debt has as one of its right the right to convert into shares, then you can roll over. Your shares will have a cost of the same as your debt, $50,000. I'm not going to talk about that one as, a, as an example. Um, the next one is quite common. It's a, it's a reorganization under Section 86 of the Income Tax Act. Basically, you might want to change the rights of the shares. Some shareholders who previously had common shares might now have PREF shares. You often do it in a, in a, in a state freeze type situation. Okay? But you can do that tax-free. You could even do it if you're thinking of selling your company to your employees. You say, I'm going to convert all my shares into PREF shares, all my common shares into PREF shares, and let the employees come in for the common shares. That would be a reorganization. You haven't got a disposition at fair market value. It's just a reorganization of your capital. 87 is the amalgamation, where two or more corporations are combining. So you now have new shares of a new corporation. What's happened to your old shares? Well, they're just sort of melded in there. And the adjusted cost base is the same as your old adjusted cost base of those shares. The other one, which we do will use, and which I think you should consider using, is where is a wind-up under Section 88, where your subsidiary is wound up. You've got rid of your shares. Should that be a disposition for the holding company? Um, the Act provides that it isn't, but it also gives you an opportunity to step up the cost of the underlying assets. And I'll look at that just in just a minute. This stuff gets is I think it's interesting, obviously. But it gets a little bit complicated, and I'd like you to slow me down. I think we've got a little bit of time. If I go too quickly, looking at tax two, I think it's important that you understand these concepts. Um, this, 
what I'm going to talk about now is ways of trying to increase the cost of, of certain assets. All right, if you're going to be selling off assets, wouldn't you like to increase their cost somehow for tax purposes? Um, you can do it. You can increase the cost of certain assets by using 88, that last one I talked about, the wind-up. But we, before we do that in our particular P trading case, we've got to be able to wind up into a holding company, and they don't hold P trading in a holding company. So the first transaction would be to use the other rollover provision. The first one I talked about, section 85. A and B transfer their shares into hold co. So if you wanted to put a little one next to this top part here, okay? It's not very good because it's the wrong pen. Um, put a little one up here. That's the first transaction. They transfer P Trading Co. shares into a holding company. What they're doing with the purchase of this, saying, just hold a moment. I think we might be able to do something better for ourselves than for you, okay? Then they would wind up P Trading. And there's a special rule that says that you can wind up and you can increase the adjusted cost base of the assets. What I've got here is the formula for doing it. What it says is you take the first of all, the adjusted cost base of the shares. Now these guys have rolled in, so the adjusted cost base of the P trading, that's of the P trading shares, is $127,000. Um, a and Holdco have agreed that the shares that Holdco buys from A will have an adjusted cost base of 37,000, because that's A's adjusted cost base. B and Holdco have agreed that it'll be 90,000 in respect of B's shares. Okay, 127,000 there. Um, in, so we've got 127,000 in total. Now we work the formula, and what the formula says that you can increase the cost of assets wound up by a certain amount, up to a certain amount, and they're only certain assets, they're really non-depreciable capital assets. So in our case they would be S company, but there's a restriction on that because we know the fair market value is equal to the cost, so we can't increase that above its original cost. But we do have a chance with the land. Okay, the land is a non-depreciable asset. We know it has a cost of 40. We know it has a fair market. We know it has an adjusted cost base of 40. We know it has a fair market value of 60. Has a potential capital gain of of 10 of $20,000, and we can increase the adjusted cost base up to that 20,000 if we fit within the formula. The formula says, first of all, you've got to look at, all the, at the cost of all the property. And I'm not going to go back to the financial statement, but if anybody wants to take a couple of hours with me, I can find the cost of the, of the assets on P Trading's financial statements to be 560,000. Plus, you add the cash. Just That's what the act says. You add the cash, and you take away the debts the debts due to third parties, to outsiders. And from the balance sheet, we know that there's current debts of 282,000 and 5,000 of long-term debt. $287,000 of debt, plus taxable dividends paid, plus capital dividends already paid. So those things that have already gone up to the holding company, you've got to add those as if they were liabilities. And you take this amount, 272, um, sorry, you take the, the, the uh, 572, and you've got 272 left. You take away the liabilities, you've got 272. You haven't got any of these other dividends. They would increase this amount. This 272 is larger than the 127, so while the Act provides for a step up in the cost base, we couldn't do it. I should mention, though, that if this sale was, if these guys had been prepared to take a capital gain at the personal level, so that the adjusted cost base of the P Trading Co shares was instead of being 127,000, was um, 327,000. So you made that a three. Then there would be an opportunity to increase the adjusted cost base of the land up to its fair market value, which would be $60,000. So that is how that provision would work. Up to about a, a week ago, we were worrying much more about whether you could do these two transactions. Let's say the third part of this was that we then sold the assets out of Holdco. We wound up P trading. We sold the assets out of Holdco. Up to a couple of weeks ago, we were worried that since we've done two transactions, in fact, we've done three, 
the first step being to transfer the shares to a holding company, the second step to be to wind up the operating company, and the third step to be to sell the assets, when what we could have done is sold the assets right out of P-trading in the first place. We were worried that those step transactions might be attacked by Revenue Canada and their attack sustained through the courts. Because of a funny bunch of English cases, we get, unfortunately, we still get part of our case law from, as you know, from England. Um, these cases all said that each transaction, each of my transactions would have to stand on its own. The transfer in, that would have, a bi have to have a business purpose. The wind up would have to have a business purpose and then the sale would have to have a business purpose. That's what these, this line of English cases said. Very recently, the Supreme Court of Canada decided in the Stubart case, which is one that's been going on for a while, that people are indeed entitled to structure their affairs in any way they like to minimize the imposition of taxes. And I think that that's, everybody breathes a big sigh of relief. It means that we can now go and do planning with the taxes in mind, but structuring our deals in different ways, basically get them into the form that we would have had them if we'd known that the tax department, that we were gonna make a transaction. Can we, so I think what you're gonna to have to think a bit is can we structure this transaction in a different way to minimize the imposition of taxes? We're not hurting the purchaser, we're just helping the vendor a little bit. That's the one way that you could increase the cost base of your assets. I keep going in the right order here. Is there a way that you can increase the cost base of your shares? Let's take as an example P trading again and look at tax three. Sorry. Look at tax three and at the bottom here, um, I'll come back to that in a minute. This should be retained earnings larger than income earned. So if you just make that correction, then it makes sense. And <laughs> another correction, these, are, these were gonna be intentional errors for those who didn't attend. They'll never pick these up. But of course, there are people who are gonna be on the video that didn't attend, and they'll, they'll know them too. Anyway, that should be a transfer under 85 one. We've got the same thing again, as you probably read it easier off yours. Um, a and B transfer their shares into a holding company and then they pay up a stock dividend. We know there's retained earnings of 174,200, so you don't even need to bother about impairing capital or the consequences of impairing capital. We pay a stock dividend of 174,000. That probably doesn't impair capital anyway. And we say that that stock dividend has a stated capital, I've called it paid up capital, but I'm, I think it's called stated capital now, of 174,200, okay? because we've got those earnings, why not? And then that increase in stated capital adds on to the adjusted cost base. Whatever the stated capital is, that adds on to the adjusted cost base. Now Holdco could sell its shares that it originally transferred in, plus these stock dividend shares, and instead of having 127,000 as its cost, it has 300 and 3,000 is its cost, 301, whatever that figure is, 301,200 as its cost. And if it only sells the shares for 300, then there's no capital gain. There is a problem though, and that is this section 55.2, which is uh, poetically called an anti-stripping provision. Um, if the retained earnings are greater than the tax retained earnings, like the income for tax purposes principally, um, there is a possible capital gain under 55.2. And let me illustrate that on tax four. We've got basically the same thing. We say here now we've got shares that we want to get rid of. We've transferred them in. We have them in the holding company. They have an adjusted cost base of $127,000 and a fair market value of 327,000, just to make it easy. We've got tax retained earnings, in fact, of our retained earnings. They happen to be the same amount, but somebody's prepared to pay 327,000 for this company. 
we have an adjusted cost base of 127. What can we do? Well, if P trading pays a dividend of 200,000 in the form of cash or in the form of a stock dividend, then we've either taken 200,000 out of the company if it's cash, or we've increased the cost by 200,000. It has the same thing, same effect. We've got 200,000, we've added on to 200,000 to the cost base, or we've reduced the fair market value by 200,000. It has the same net result if we're going to sell. So one way that you might do it with the cash, if you don't have the cash, you could say to the new company who's going to buy the shares, hey, why don't you subscribe for preferred shares of 200,000, and we'll rip whip the cash out. You've got the same cost base. You don't care. Um, and then we'll sell you the common shares for 127,000. Take it he had to go rather than that he wanted to go. Um, what are the results of this particular transaction? We really avoided the capital gain. Mind you, we still have it at the personal level, but in the meantime, we've, we've got rid of the company and we've paid no taxes on it, theoretically. The results are that the 25,800 of goodwill or non um, non-tax gain has been stripped out. It really isn't represented by underlying earnings. We've just taken that value out of the company because we can get a tax-free dividend because the corporations are, quotes, connected. I don't think I have to go through that, but they, they are connected corporations, more than 10% um, by ownership and by voting con and by value is owned by whole code, so it can always get a dividend out tax-free. Um, the 55.2 55 would come along and it would treat the whole of that 200,000 as a capital gain, not just part of it. However, there's a saving provision. If you file your tax return and in your tax return I say, hey, I want that to be treated as two dividends, then uh, you can elect, you can just, you'd pay the capital gain on any one of them. So they would treat the 28, 25.8. But the wording is kind of wishy-washy in 55.2. It's sort of reasonably attributed to and all those kind of words that you get in the Income Tax Act. And if you go saying, I want to treat it as two dividends, the tax department will come along and say, why? And they'll hit you with the tax on the capital gain. Um, there's a problem with that. There are exceptions to this application of 55.2. And once again, I think these are ones that you might be able to use. They won't apply this principle even if you've got rid of shares subsequently. If the capital gain itself cannot reasonably be attributable to anything other than income. So if the capital gain itself is attributable to the income, you know, the capital gain that it looks like you might have avoided by doing that is attributable to income, then that's all right. But then they go on and in private rulings they say, yeah, but goodwill is not really attributable to income. So you don't know what is, but the wording is, is there if your capital gain that you might have avoided is really attributable to income of any corporation in the group, then you're all right. The, um, there's an exception where the transaction is not at arm's length, and I think that should read not at arm's length. All right. But then it goes on to say that if you're structuring your arrangement somewhere, um, and that should read 55.4, not 53.4, and it should read 55.3 and not 53.3. I'm looking at tax five now. Um, sorry about that. Those figures should be 55 and 55. My threes and my fives look much the same. Um, if you try and structure, get yourself into a position where you're not dealing at arm's length because you have, you, you get into that kind of arrangement, then they'll say that if the only reason you've done it is to avoid the application of these rules, then they'll deal you to deal at arm's length so that you won't be, won't be getting the, the advantage. You won't be able to sell. Really what they're looking at is you're trying to sell and getting, taking your dividends out first. The other thing is, if the dividend that you got was received in a course of a series of transactions, this is an exception again, or events, the, pr the principal purpose of which is to effect a reorganization to distribute properties to other corporations if each transferee 
receives a pro rata share of each corporation. Now that's a big mouthful. But what that means is that you can do what is commonly termed a butterfly transaction. And people have thrown butterfly transaction at me and then we got to talking about it and I realized in a hurry that they didn't know what a butterfly transaction was and I didn't know what a butterfly transaction was. So I thought what I'd try and do on tax five, tax six, is illustrate what is essentially a butterfly transaction. And I think you can see why it's called a butterfly. It looks like a butterfly. I don't know if I'm speaking the converted, but I think it's useful to go through this. Um, basically, we might have P trading, and P trading might have two, two divisions, A and B. And A and B as individuals might say, look, this is intolerable. Um, I'm trying to be the manager of A, and you're trying to be the manager of B, and it's just not working out. We've got to sell our corporation because we just can't work together. Well, there's an alternative, and that is to basically separate the company into two. And you can do that on a rollover basis. It sounds complicated. What you're really doing is using a combination of Section 85 and the fact that you can always pay tax-free dividends between connected corporations. Those corporations that are controlled by the same group of people or where a 10% ownership is. So let me just take you, if I can, through these transactions. So the first step would be what is identified as one, and A and B, they transfer their shares in P trading into holding companies, separate holding companies, not, not one holding company, but separate holding companies. So A transfers is into A, and B transfers is into B. That you can do tax-free under Section 85, no problem, okay? And since they control Holco B, they, it's, happy, it's happy to have that same cost. The next thing that happens is that these two Holdcos, they incorporate new subsidiaries. Okay, so we've got, and I'll just deal with Hold Co A, the same thing, it's a mirror image for Hold Co B, but Hold Co A incorporates a subsidiary, a wholly owned subsidiary, sub Co A. And then P Trading says, hey, now I've got a corporation that if I take back shares, I can transfer assets to. So it transfers Division A into sub Co A. which is an 85 rollover transaction again. It transfers that in and it takes back shares. The properties of the shares, you have to consider them because what ultimately you want is a dividend. So you would want to make sure that the paid up capital, the stated capital of those shares that P trading takes back from Subco is um, equal to the adjusted cost base of the assets in Division A. Now, Let's not bother with that at the moment. I'm just talking about the principle, a way of doing it. Mechanically, it'll work out fine, and you'll do it if you talk to any of your tax guys. Then the next step is that P Trading redeems the shares in Subco. Now, you might say, well, where's the cash coming from? Well, we'll just get the cash for a while. We'll need it for a little while, okay? Maybe, when, maybe Holco borrowed it from the bank. Let's take that as an example. Holco borrowed the cash from the bank, and it subscribed for shares in Subco A. So we don't use that cash to buy the assets from P Trading. We use the cash when P Trading redeems the shares, because what we want is a dividend. We don't want to purchase. We want a dividend to go up to P Trading, because we know that dividend can go up tax-free. Now P Trading has the cash, and P Trading redeems the shares held by Holco in it. These are the shares formerly held by A directly. And the money goes back to Holco A, and Holco A then pays back the bank. So the cash has gone all around the horn, and the bank is now out of it. And what has happened is that you have, while P trading still exists, Holco A doesn't have any part of it, and it doesn't have any part of Subco A. And Holco A now owns 100% Subco A. And it can do what it likes with it. It can wind it up if that's what it wants to do. 
All right, so it's one company again, or it continued to hold it like that. And then in due course, you would do the same thing on the other side with whole co B, and you'd find that all the assets of P trading had been stripped out into subco B or subco A, and there is no need for P trading anymore. It's completely disappeared. So what you've done with that piece of magic is got rid of that company, and you've got two separate subsidiaries of two separate companies. And that is permitted under paragraph 55.3b of the, of the Act. Now, that is a bit of a complicated one to start off with. The rest of it's going to be a little simpler from here on in. Does anybody have any questions on that? Basically, what I'm using is two things. The rollover provisions provided in Section 85 and the fact that you can pay tax-free intercorporate dividends. 1977, they got rid of all that stupid designated surplus concept that used to worry everybody. They said you can pay intercorporate dividends completely tax-free. There's no part four tax even, provided that you own more than 10%, which is a recent change, but more than 10% by votes and 10% by value. Used to be you could only do that with private companies. You can now do it with public companies as well. But that's a way of hiving off a piece of the business if that's what you want to do without having to go through the sale, without resulting in tax. And there'll be situations when you may want to do that. And in fact, I was involved in just exactly one of those where a husband and wife had a parting of the ways. They did have two vision, divisions, and that's what they did. And now, as happy as they can be with each other, they're happy with each other. Okay, I think what about the way there are other rollover provisions, of course, like you know, between husband and, and wife, as you know, they can be transferred free of tax. But there wasn't really a way where on a tax-free basis we could separate the two companies without doing that particular thing. I would like to talk about holding companies. Does anybody have any questions on that? Is anybody still awake? I'm like, losing sight of you now because of, of the lights. Um, anybody awake? Just hold up your hands. Just nod gently. Um, a friend of mine told me that he once talked to a group and there was just the lights in his eyes all the way through the thing. And he was told to keep it fairly technical because these were going to be the technicians of the future. And so he was talking technical computeries from an accountant's point of view because he thought that's what they were. And they were a bunch of technical guys who knew how to make the things operate if you put the right electrical force to it. And he said that after an hour of very, very learned discussion on the future of computers, what it's going to mean to the, the, the consulting um, profession, they turned on the lights to find that his audience that had started at 500 had now whittled down to three. And they, quite honestly, were all still asleep. There were three people in the front row. He said a devastating experience. So I'd like to see a little bit. Anyway, I'd like to talk about the use of holding companies because I think they still haven't had the play they should have done. I think there are still some dangers with them. OK, let's just looking at tax seven. Basically, what I'm saying is why wouldn't A and B maybe have had holding companies in the first place to hold their, their, tra their shares? I'm going to come back and look at what might have happened if they'd sold P Trading Co shares in the corporation, whether that was whether that would penalize them or not. But let's look at this first proposition, that Hold Co A and Hold Co B are the two holding companies for A and B. We know that they can transfer the shares in. What are the advantages? Well, first of all, tax-free dividends can go up from P trading to the two companies. And what can happen with those? Well, they can be reinvested in P trading on a secured basis. I've seen too many companies that have started off doing well. The principal shareholder said, hey, things are going well. I'll leave it in the hands of my manager. Goes down, it gets messed up while he's away, and he's got a bankrupt company when he comes back. He ranks behind all the creditors to what he gets out. I think it always makes sense to try and rank as high up the ladder as you can. Pay up the dividend to the hold co. Lou and I have a client right now where we've done this for a couple of million dollars up, lending it back down with a floating charge. First, actually, yes, rank behind the bank. Second floating charge on the assets. We know that if push comes to shove, he's going to get his money out before the regular creditors get it out, before the preferred shareholders get it out. That's not a bad thing to do just on an ongoing basis. So even if you need all the money in P trading, 
pay it up as a dividend, lend it back down again. So that's what you have to do on a secured basis. Or it could be invested outside before any personal tax. Or you could have a situation where hold co A and hold co B or have cross insurance on A and B. You're paying for that insurance out of pre-personal tax dollars. Um, it's part of my own introduction when I do it because I don't do very much. I always tell people that I'm one of the co-editors of personal tax planning in the Canadian Tax Journal. And we get a bunch of people to write articles and every now and then somebody goes on strike and says, I'm not writing. And either Paul Gracious, who's my co-editor or myself, pitches in and, and does one. I'm talking about all of that only because there is a recent article which I happened to do, plagiarized all the thoughts from everybody else in, uh, on shareholders' agreements where I sort of talk about where the insurance might be hold, held with the new rules and so on. And that, in that, I talk about some of these concepts that I'm going to talk about now, why I think holding companies are good. If any of you have an interest, um, you'll find it. I can't remember which issue it was, but it was earlier this year. Earlier this year. I think it was earlier this year. Anyway, the other thing you do is segregate the post-82 preferred earnings um, either in P trading or out of it. Um, what you want to try and do, these are earnings that would otherwise, the post-80, sorry, you try and segregate those earnings because they're the ones that you pay a distribution tax. I'll come back to that distribution tax in a minute. But they're the ones you pay this 12.5% iniquitous distribution tax on. So what you try and do is get money up into these holding companies so that you don't have to pay that tax. And every corporation, if the laws go through as they're proposed, every corporation is going to be subject to that 12.5% distribution tax, mainly because every corporation is going to qualify each year for that 200,000 know, of income that qualifies for the small business deduction. And I think right now you should be thinking of ways of segregating those earnings that were pre-82 up in your, in your whole codes, whole codes A's and whole code B, or in one whole code, if that's what you've got. So those are getting those tax-free dividends up into the top company. That's the, the purpose of that little discussion. You might sometimes want to hold assets, real estate, for example, safe from the creditors of P trading. If you've got the real estate up 